frequently. Like a lot of our stuff stemmed from those original ripples that came out of that original timeline series. Yeah, and not just for you guys, uh, for our fan fiction writers, I'll often get requests from our fans. They'll go, hey, is there, has there been a story about this or whatnot? And I'll go, okay, I'll take a couple minutes out of my time, and I'll find some old post on the old website from 2012. I'm like, yeah, this is kind of what you were talking about. We, yeah, we do get a lot of questions about, like, oh, I'm thinking about doing a story about this. Is this okay? Does this fit in the lore? And what's kind of nice about Star Citizen, the usual answer is, as long as it's, a small contained story, the answer is yes, you can probably write that story in Star Citizen. It's a huge universe, it's multiple space systems, everything can happen there. As long as you're not saying like a whole planet is made out of cheese, like right. it's okay. But if it's a small group of people, they can have a weird, strange, awesome adventure. And, so. and it's like if the, the, the ramifications of it, you know, if you're writing a character who's like the, gonna be the guy who shot Ivar Messer, that would obviously conflict with sort of our yeah. established lore. But you could write someone who was struggling against Ivar Messer who, you know, died or went over to the dark side, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. As long as it's sort of within the framework and, yeah, it doesn't really mess with kind of the established stuff. There's a lot of potential to do. Uh, while we're talking about the, the fan fiction stuff, there, were, there are writer's guides. That we've released yes. a, a several posts. Uh, yeah, I think it was ultimately it was 13, a 13 installment thing. We actually need to probably update it soon. Probably. Uh, <laughs> but it was, yeah, it was basically, it was because at the time, yeah, we were getting a lot of, there was a, a very, I mean, from the day we launched, we had a huge fan fiction section. So this was sort of an attempt to kind of put together a cohesive guide that was written outside of lore. So we could say like, hey, if you're writing for the government, this is the type of character that they are, and you should write them like this. You know, this is how the military kind of acts, you yeah. know, type, type stuff, rather than having to frame it within some kind of fictional context. But that way, people could kind of go like, "Oh, okay, the, you know, the Banu were like this, the Xi'an like this, the Vandal were like this." You know, so, uh, but yeah, we do need to update that. But uh, I think a lot of that heavy lifting will hopefully be taken on by the Galacticpedia when that right. goes live. Yeah. Because a lot of that kind of bite-sized information chunks we're putting effort into developing that more. Yeah. Yeah, I've been spending <laughs> I've been spending a lot of time referring to some of the older material, like the Time Capsule series and the Writer's Guides trying to do the first pass on all the Galactopedia articles. It's been really helpful, and I gotta say, I really like the Time Capsule series. Yeah. That's one of my favorites. So the Time Capsule... They're okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the, the Time Capsule series was one of the first, thing, the first things that we published, uh, yeah. along with the, was the Kid Crimson and the Cassandra's Tears? Yeah, that was after the announcement. Okay. So basically, um, Chris ended up really liking the, the Time Capsule thing as a, as a way to dispense kind of little bite-sized bits of knowledge. And so that, after we, we, we did the announcement, uh, there was sort of a, okay, so how are we gonna keep, we started to get this massive interest, how do we kind of keep it going? And, uh, and so yeah, he wanted to kind of keep that thread alive. So that turned into our sort of weekly news dispatch that we still do today. Like we do a week of, this, now it's Tuesdays. Mm -hmm. Every Tuesday it's a single news article that kind of gives you a sense of what's happening in the universe and, and stuff like that, but uh, but yeah, then we I was doing the Cassandra's Tears, which was a Cal Mason story, and Kid Crimson. Uh, it was like I think it was like Monday was Cal Mason, Wednesday was News Dispatch, Friday was Kid Crimson, mm -hmm. or until uh, December. Okay. And those stories are still available on the website. Yeah, yeah, you so. can go if you go into the Spectrum Dispatch section, you can find all of them. Okay. So uh, before we get to the process once we've started making the game, this is all before we've started building the game. When, when Chris comes to you and says, we're gonna make this game, it's gonna be this massive sprawling universe, where do you start? Like, what, 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 do you remember the very first thing, the, ver the very first piece, if it's not too spoiler related? Uh, the, the, like, where do you start when you have to create a massive universe for, 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 video, for two video games? Yeah, I mean, the thing with the, the, the Fall of the Roman Empire thing was a helpful thing because that's sort of thematically fine tuned sort of a, okay, so you have a, an empire under strain, financial, military strain, mm -hmm. and it's reaching a breaking point. As a, as a kickoff point, that you have a lot to go with in that. Uh, I mean, I always, to me it always seems like, you know, it's like sketching. If you start, part of the approach for, for drawing is you start with the broad shapes. Oh. And then, yeah, ovals and, and kind of flow and, you know, and pose. And then you refine the shape and you fill in the details. It's kind of the same thing. I mean, it's very easy. It's a, or I would say it's probably 
very, very hard to start really, really micro and be like, I'm going to write out <laughs> religion from now until the 30th century and completely develop that on its, in a vacuum and then go, all right, I've done that. Now I'm going to do food, you know, so like <laughs> it's, every food. Yeah. Like it gets very, you know, you're just going to, you're going to snow yourself under and you're never actually going to build the big picture. So it's easier to start kind of big. Yeah. We, we have, there's so many needs for us coming from a lot of the different areas, departments, like guns and engines and main storylines and planetary write-ups that we operate very much on a, a need basis. Like yeah. we don't have time, unfortunately, sit there and flesh out a full, like every Murray Cuff racer since the history of it. We only know the years that we had to write about for particular stories yeah. and they'll keep growing in and filling in as we need it. If we need it, like if there aren't requests at the Murray Cup headquarters for a plaque that lists every winner, then we'll have to sit down and do right. it, which that's a pretty good idea. <laughs> but, uh, but still, so so it's kind of fun. Like sometimes we get questions about like, when did this happen or what is this? Until we kind of focus in on that, it doesn't exist. <laughs> how, how cool would it be to have a Murray Cup plaque in the lobby of the office with all the winners? That would be pretty cool. Yeah. All right. You could put in a, a Jira task for that. Put in a Jira <laughs> All right. So. Uh, so that's that's before the, the, the campaign. The campaign is, is up and running. We're, we funded Star Citizen. Now we have to start making the game. So uh, you, you've got your you've got requests that come from story, the things that you want to see in the game. But now you're getting requests from designers, requests from game designers that like, we need something for this. We want to build this. Yeah. How does that process work? I mean, it, yeah, as, as Will said, I mean, it kind of comes from all over. I mean, we get we'll get requests from. Um, you know, item designers who are like, hey, I need, uh, you know, who manufactures light light bulbs, you know, and then in the same day get another request that's like, hey, we're building this space station. What is it? You know, type, we need to, and here's some concept art or rough things, or here's what, or if it's from a game design standpoint, like, here's what gameplay mechanic we're trying to satisfy, you know, or, or need or moment, something like that. So yeah, it can kind of come from from anywhere. It's is mm -hmm. the thing, and we and you know, we just sort of have to roll with punches and kind of change scope. It's yeah. been kind of interesting seeing the change as the game comes farther along our interaction with the designers. Because I don't even want to speak for this with on the dispatches. Like the dispatches a year ago, we would be pulling a lot more from the ether of like this is what interests us now. Mm -hmm. And now the gameplay that's going on, the actual design is feeding in a lot more into what we're writing as these releases and the content builds up. Yeah, it makes it um it makes it uh, uh, sometimes easier to actually tell a story because we know how that experience is going to be in game. So I have a question uh, for writing something about a Dana runner. I can go and I can sit and I can talk to Matt Sherman. How does the Herald work? Like how fast? Like what is it good at? What is it bad at? What? How do you how do you foresee this happening? So it makes it um, makes it a lot of fun to be able to provide those specifics or kind of even layer some of those in. So as people read the dispatches, they're getting this broader story, but. There's one or two hints as to the gameplay that we're foreseeing and that we're actually uh, actually implementing and building in the game. Hmm. One of the, you mentioned corporations. One of the things that is unique to Star this Citizen, is, uh, uh, two uh, years old, old, this is the sheer number of corporations that we have. <laughs> uh, before we move on, talk to me real quick. A small commercial break. I had to look my uh, uploads to uh, YouTube. I'm looking, uh, I'm losing a lot of subscribers on this, but uh, that's just too bad. I like to upload this because I like uh, the game Star Citizen, and uh, yes, I lost uh, many hundred subscribers. So anyway, uh, just a small break. I need to uh, check my uh, upload to YouTube, and we have 20, 28 minutes left. To buy uh, this ship, I just bought this prospector. It's, it's mining ship. You need to have that, but 
I have so low frame rate, so there's no reason I buy it now. Yes, I'll be back. Electricity in the air. Do you smell those ionized particles? Do you feel your bowels loosening with a deep thrum from hundreds of thrusters firing at once? That, my friends, can only mean one thing. Galactic Tour is once again at the Intergalactic Aerospace Expo. This is the premier air and space show in the Empire. The IAE has the biggest manufacturers, the best modders, and the greatest pilots all gathered in one spot for enthusiasts like us to gawp at. I mean, if I had a cred for every time I've said, whoa, you see that? I would be slightly more wealthy than I already am. The point is, I am excited. The best part, we're gonna be here all week long. Get ready for exclusive events, exciting announcements, limited edition ship variants, and exclusive insider access with me, Jax McCleary. There's a lot more coming in the days ahead, so strap in and hold on. Trust me, you're going to want to see this. Welcome back to the Expo. I'm Jax McCleary, and today Galactic Tour is going to be spending some time with the grandfather of them all, Roberts Space Industries. The name is almost as synonymous with spaceflight as the term spaceflight itself. Sadly, although they may have invented the quantum drive and dozens of other technological wonders we rely on every day, they haven't been at the cutting edge in centuries. But then that's not why you fly an RSI ship, is it? You fly them because after all this time, their ships still remain at the forefront of exploration, on the front lines of battles, and in the hangars of new teenage pilots everywhere. You fly them because their ships work. And here on the expo floor, RSI is clearly working overtime. Not only are they bragging non-stop about their new Polaris, but they have their full, impressive range of ships in every class and size proudly on display. To that end, when we come back, we'll finally tackle the eternal question. How many Auroras can fit inside the mighty Bengal's main hangar? That and more, as Galactic Tour's Intergalactic Aerospace Expo special continues. are really going full blast as expo goers swarm the hall to get up close and personal with all the latest and greatest and we're right alongside them elbowing to the front of the line to get a first-hand look at a brand that inspires as much loyalty as it does uncomfortable glances i'm talking of course about drake interplanetary if controversy made your ships fly better then drake ships would probably fly a heck of a lot better that's not to say piloting a ship from the no-frills manufacturer doesn't have its advantages. These are ships designed to get you from A to B in one piece, often with all your stuff still aboard. And 
and sometimes, if the rumours are to be believed, with other people's stuff too. To quote Drake's marketing team, these are multi-role vessels, which, when translated, means they may not do anything perfectly, but they do a hell of a lot pretty damn well. Okay. Uh, the upload is running. For hosting a wedding. There's plenty more coming up as Galactic Tours Intergalactic Aerospace Expo Special continues. With two minutes left. About why there are so many corporations and what that brings to Star Citizen. Uh, I mean, it's, it's it basically it's kind of a testament to the sort of level of fidelity in the thinking because it's not, you know, hey, this is a ship, it's a shape that has these attachments on it and just kind of go like, I mean, these things are really meticulously designed. And they have a lot of, I mean, all the components that you can, mm -hmm. you know, you can look at and stuff like that. And they're, they're built as actual, like, kind of engineering things. So based on sort of the internal coding system, as far as the assets go, you know, the, the different cooler, everything has this sort of, like, a tag, a code mm -hmm. tag. So it's become sort of corporation, codes, and, and that will help dictate, I mean, art style, all kinds of stuff. So basically, like... Yeah, everything gets assigned to a company. So somebody, if it if it exists and you can sort of manipulate it, someone's we have to decide who makes that. Uh, and in, in like in a lot of ways, it helps the artists in that once we come up with one item of that company, they have that style guide and you can go to it. But all that history and lore does make it difficult sometimes because if there's like a space station that was supposed to be abandoned 150 years ago and they're using this prop to populate it. And we have to be like, well, actually, that company didn't exist till 50 years ago, according to lore. So those <laughs> items wouldn't be there. And they're like, well, we don't have another version of this item. And then, yeah. And yeah, that's it. Whose job, <laughs> whose job is it to track all these corporations? Oh, I think it's kind of a team effort. Yeah. I mean, we do, we do have a corporation matrix in mm. Complex that just lists all of the corporations along various aspects of them, like when they were founded, what they make, what their visual feel is. A little bit of the history. And for those who may not know what Confluence is, Confluence is our... Uh, Confluence is our internal wiki that we keep to keep track of game development. It's our game design document, more or less. And that's sort of your realm. I know it's when everybody's got, anybody's got a problem <laughs> or a question about Confluence, it's, go ask Sherry. Go ask Sherry, that's me. <laughs> okay. So in addition to Confluence, let's move into the star map. Mm. So the star map is, is one of the one of the craziest things that we've put out. It, it's one of the most, uh, if, if I can say so myself, I had nothing to do with it. But it's it, one of the most impressive things that, that, that's part of the Star Citizen experience in my, in my yeah. perspective. Uh, where did the idea for the star map come from? I think it was an early, so it was an early stretch goal. I don't know. I actually don't know where. There was a, there was a, an early stretch goal that was like a, was the printed one that yes. we ended up releasing. Uh, but it, it was the cartographer Room, right? Yeah, there was a, there was, oh, there was an in-game yeah, yeah. in stellar cartography room. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but it was just—it was also the thing too. It's there's this sort of inherent thing, like we have, you know, the, the star map is the known universe, and, and so part of the aspect of the game is going to be, you know, d discovering jump points. Like, you you have to make it scale the map scalable because mm -hmm. if you discover if someone discovers a new jump point to a new system, then the star map is going to change. Like, it's not a fixed thing. So. Mm -hmm. Having an interactive version of it, uh, you know, had a sort of a practical need, but I think it was also just like, you know, uh, Benoit like, just totally sold the concept of it. It was oh, incredible. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a fun thing to look at, but it's also, especially considering the history and the number of systems we have, it's so vitally important that we understand the connections between all these different worlds, because it does inform the history of, oh, so if... Uh, you know, this, this system was discovered at this time because this event big happened here. We need to make sure that this was the path that people got to go there. Oh, so, that was a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we came all the specific... Because uh, the map changed, too. Yes. Like, yeah. had, the map has changed about eight, eight times. Like, as far, I mean, even just from the very first few days where it was like, you know, 20 systems. And then the stretch goal, the $4 million stretch goal was 50 systems. And then I can't remember, it was like $7 million, it was 100 systems, you know, yeah. something like that. Mm -hmm. And... And so that's where it sort of stayed. But like even the placement of these things, like as yeah. tech was coming online, they were like, oh, actually, we could do this system first, and you know that. So they they started rearranging it to mimic that sort of thing. So yeah. it was, 
and the star map is just the known system, the, 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 the known UE, Human. known systems to humans. Mm -hmm. yep. So Correct. it's not all the systems that will be in the star system. Yeah, the Xi'an keep, play the cards close to their chest so they don't. So, so yeah, the, the idea to, start, to do the star map, there's obviously a lot of use for it. How do you go about creating it? It's, it's, uh, it seems like it's a massive data entry thing. Not, not just the design stuff, and our friends at Turbulent you know, handled the, the heavy lifting of the graphic oh, yeah. design stuff, but you guys had to do the data entry, right? We did. We also worked with someone at Turbulent, uh, Scott, who helped us out with data entry. Uh, he was a big help. Um, but yeah, right up to the last day before we launched the star map, we were still inputting data and making sure everything was double checked, everything looked good, there were visu it was visually consistent with what our descriptions of the system actually was. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that was another thing that really helped because the need was there. It helped us focus in on fleshing out yeah. a lot of, like some of the systems we would have, like we would know like the feature planet and that there was three other worlds there, but maybe those worlds were just like, one's kind of a gas giant. Mm -hmm. yeah. So like we had to go in and really think, all right, what is this? And answering that question, because we're not just a procedurally generated universe, we want there to be reasons to go travel around. So really trying to give distinct flavor mm -hmm to all the worlds and all of X number of systems. Right. Mysterious number. Um, <laughs> and, and the stars, the, the stars and galaxies, it's not just uh, science fiction, there's science to it. You, uh, who did you guys, you guys work with anybody, astronomers or anything like that to, to make sure things yeah. are as scientifically possible or scientifically accurate as? Yes, we worked with uh, two master students of uh, astrophysics. Stephen and Michael, great people. <laughs> hi, Stephen. Hi, Michael. Hi, guys. And hi, and hi Scott. <laughs> Scott. Thanks, Scott. Um, so we actually have very, very fleshed out data of uh, all the star systems that we have released to the public so far with things like um, the positions of the planets in AU, uh, orbital speed, the length of the day, the type of planet it is, and so on and so forth, so that we can put the data into the game possible. With the goal, like, of, with the possible. goal of realistic with feeling. The goal, with the goal <laughs> yeah. of realistic feeling. So we, we have this realistic physics, but we want to make sure that the, the system feels as real as possible. And so that's why we have these, these numbers. With, with sometimes responses from the physicists being, well, well you know what I mean. <laughs> You're uh, kind of, I guess you <laughs> Yeah, there were a couple of times when we really wanted to do something cool, and they had to say, that's not really a thing. Shove them. <laughs> that was the death of Will's cheese planet. Yeah, that's why we don't have a cheese planet. You, you seemed very uh, 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 sullen when we said no cheese planet. Well, he said it was that close to the sun, it would melt. I don't know. Yeah. But, so then he thought it was a nacho planet. Yeah, 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 a so planet. nacho cheese. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. But on the other hand, they also helped us come up with really cool ideas. Like if we had kind of a, a general idea of a cool thing we wanted in a system, say, um, if we wanted to have a really dense asteroid cluster, they helped us figure out ways we can make those scientifically possible. It's, it's been the, since I started this project, the one truism that I've learned is if someone says that it can't happen in space, wait a week and someone will discover it. <laughs> <laughs> because every time, like, the, the discoveries that have happened since I started this job and really focusing on learning about space science has been insane. Like, all the weird planets that have, people have found with their mm -hmm. telescopes and Picking up radio waves and stuff. It's like a planet made entirely of diamond? Yeah. That's oh. real. <laughs> oh. All right. So before we run out of time, I want to get some, some, some quick lightning around here. Uh, how does, uh, coming up, uh, we, we've got stars in Alpha 2.6, but then we've got stars in Alpha 3.0 on the horizon, Ooh, yeah. which seems like it's going to be a much broader expansion of story possibilities. Right. How, what's it like working on that right now? What, what's that process like? Uh, it's... I mean, it's actually, it's a, it's a nice, interesting change of pace because um, Squadron 42, while being a lot of fun, was uh, because it's a very narrative military drama mm -hmm. or action space opera. This was nice to be able to have more different, weirder characters. So you could, yes, because this we're video more is two years old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, there's like the, the just all the different, the, the, the planets that we're going to and stuff like that. It's, Definitely much wilder character. Because in V zero, you know, we're we're starting off smaller and we're going to keep adding and adding to it. And V zero, in three point is our V zero kind of fleshing out a, 
a world. So we tried for like diversity and to really hit some interesting people just to start getting like a smattering of the kind of characters that we want to have there and slowly building out and trying to figure out. It's, it's really complicated and exciting. <laughs> there is. And after that, and then there's Squadron 42. Yeah. Squadron 42, the single player component to Star Citizen. Uh, how long is that script now? How many pages? We, we've mentioned the page count a couple times, and every time we've mentioned it, it seems like the number has gotten larger. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was 1255. I think it's gone up a little bit because we added some uh, generic engineer stuff. Uh, 